Uh, good evening. Good to see you again. Yeah. This is a meeting of the Northampton Public Works Commission. Today is Wednesday, July 22nd, 2015. Uh, we have a single item on our agenda, but first we have public comment, but I see no one from the public. So we will move on to the item on the agenda, which is a presentation of our draft comprehensive wastewater management plan that's been underworked by the city and our consultants Kleinfelder for quite some time. Um, you may recall that we have a subcommittee that uh, met a few times and is somewhat familiar with the details but the rest of the commission has not been presented with this information which is why we decided to have this meeting first and then I believe Ned we're headed to public presentations um, in September. That's correct. That's, that's correct. Yeah, I don't see the September date yet, but it would be September uh, 16th at the Senior Center at 5:30, and September 30th at 6:30 at JFK. So 5:30 Senior Center on Con yeah. Street, 6:30 JFK Community Room. Okay. All right. So as far as the history goes, we started this project in 2009 as far as a request with the City Council for funding. It took about a year to get the, uh, the loan in order to actually start the work. So we actually started work in 2011 on this. And like I said, the, the past year we've been kind of delayed because of the stormwater utility for a bit. But we're trying to wrap this up so we finish it and get it into submission to NEPA and DEP this fall so that we can start the process. Okay. I'll turn it over to David Peterson, and I'm going to turn the lights here so you can see it a little better. All right. Thank you. Yeah, so uh, my name is uh, David Peterson. I'm uh, with Kleinfelder. I'm a civil engineer, mainly focused on wastewater. I'm project manager of the of this job. Um, Pam Westgate is from Kleinfelder as well. She's in our Springfield office and is a wastewater process engineer. Um, as well as uh, you know, kind of a planning engineer and, and of all sorts of wastewater. So, um, our team uh, is quite a bit bigger than the two of us. Uh, we have a bunch of folks back in the office, um, and also in addition to you know us, obviously the city is a, is a massive part of this effort. Um, you know, between you know starting with Andy with the GIS and and Felix and John Hall and um, the folks down at the plant and Ned and Jim obviously. Uh, it's a very uh, large collaborative effort uh, to get to the point where we are today. And as Ned did say, uh, we did start this um, in 2011 is when I got involved. However, it did uh, get in late 2010. I remember there was a lot of negotiation with Massachusetts DEP as to the scope of the project. So this, this project is really um, supported by and consistent with the way uh, DEP wants uh, comprehensive wastewater management plans to be conducted. And the, the hope is that you know once this process is done, DEPs reviewed it and they approve it as a CWMP, uh, that'll actually allow the city to be more competitive for um, state revolving fund loans for capital uh, investment. And th that'll become uh, discussed a little bit later in, in the slides, um, but that is, is something that's you know pretty important in the way that the scoping of this whole project went. So we did want to uh, walk through a very high level. So obviously this has been a, a large project, it's been taken three to four years. Uh, there's a lot of detail which we're just not going to be able to squeeze into one hour um, and that's what Pam and I are hoping to limit this to is one hour and um, so certainly those, those papers have been handed out that have more detail than what the slides show um, if you have any detailed questions you know feel free to ask us uh, we did kind of take like as Ned was saying a bit of a maybe a winter break <laughs> while the stormwater utility was, was getting um, done up so you know, I might even have to go back to my notes on a few things, but um, you know, but we'll get there. So, in terms of the agenda, we did want to review the overall CMP process, uh, what the various tasks were, um, how they all come together to <coughs> formulate the rec recommendations. Uh, the various tasks um, look to define the existing conditions of the collection system and of the wastewater treatment plant, and then we're going to actually look at future conditions as to how much growth do we think we'll see in the city, and. You know, is the plant, is the collection systematically sized to handle that growth? Um, risk approach to uh, prioritization is um, sort of a, an approach that's 
uh, been introduced by planners and engineers into uh, long-term planning, which is basically to look at um, a, a metric-based qualitative way to sort of prioritize the recommendations that come out of the study. And uh, so that, we'll discuss that a little bit more. Um, and then kind of the final few steps are picking the, the projects to address what we what we found to be issues in the collective system of the plant, um, what those costs are, what order do we want to put them in, and how do we actually implement the program. Um, this program is intended to cover a 20-year planning period. So it's, it's, very, it's a very long-term program, and I, I, I think most people in the room are aware you know, we feel comfortable with the first five years of the program, and we kind of want to maybe gather, you know, huddle up again towards the end of that and sort of look at the, remain, the remainder of the, the planning period. Because uh, things do change, you know. Priorities change, outside drivers affect the way that we need to do things. So we definitely don't want to cement the next 20 years going forward. We want to be flexible with it. So I'll just cover the, the process a little bit. I, this is essentially the title slide or the agenda that I just went through, but I did want to walk through the individual uh, tasks that we went through to define existing conditions. Um, first of all, the, we looked at the wastewater collection system. Let me just step over here. The wastewater collection system and the, and the treatment facility. So basically, what, what's their existing condition? What's their size? How do they function? You know, is everything looking OK? Um, in the upper right, we have an on-site wastewater needs assessment, which more or less is the areas of the city that are not sewered or, you know, septic systems, et cetera. Uh, we tried to take a look as, is there really a need or a driver to extend sewers there? Maybe consider uh, distributed wastewater treatment, um, you know, groundwater disposal, you know, those kinds of things. Um, so that was that, that task. Infiltration and inflow is, uh, is a component of pretty much every CWMP, and it's a very very important uh, component for the DEP. Um, it looks at uh, extraneous water, whether it's rainwater or groundwater, that's getting into the collection system and ending up at the wastewater treatment plant. Um, this can really starve a uh, collection system capacity and can be a real issue in some communities. So uh, we wanted to do a, a fairly uh, quantitative analysis of, of II in the system. And then hydraulic capacity is somewhat related to II, where if you, if you do have issues or if your system is just you know, undersized, uh, you may see some hydraulic issues, which would be, um, it can end up in what we call sanitary sewer overflows or SSOs, where you actually see flooding out of the streets uh, or back, backups into people's basements. Um, but even beyond that, just simply having a sewer system reach 100% capacity and those water level actually goes up to the manhole a little bit and comes back down, I mean, that would be considered a, a, an undersized sewer system because it's not, it's not designed to do that. So we try to develop a computer-based model to uh, take a look at the capacity within the collection system. And then the last thing is the future conditions. So we developed an approach to uh, look at basically the way the land is used in the city, taking into account some of the long-term planning objectives of the city uh, to determine uh, what's the likely uh, growth that the city might see. Uh, we do look at population projections as part of this um, and uh, basically calculate out you know, what that flow is going to be, what the pollutant load to the plant is going to be, and compare it to what we can handle today. So all of these existing future conditions will identify a few uh, potential deficiencies where we find, well, you know, X needs to be fixed or Y needs to be upsized, et cetera. We want to put that through the risk-based prioritization, which will allow us to basically enumerate the projects from, you know, the biggest need to, you know, maybe not quite the biggest need. Um, and this, I have to caveat this to say there's always going to be some sort of a, a manual, you know, gut check where we're talking about the projects and it doesn't make sense, you know, this one just doesn't seem to make sense, we should make that one higher. That's certainly fine, that happens all the time where, uh, you know, just local knowledge and stuff like that will affect the prioritization. So then all the deficiencies in the projects will, will be put into a two-step alternatives analysis phase where we identify uh, a large pool of candidate projects to resolve the deficiencies. And then we review those through a series of screen analyses and we develop cost estimates and life cycle cost estimates uh, for those alternatives that make sense to do so. And we identify what would be the preferred uh, project or the preferred alternative to resolve the particular deficiency. And so all the preferred all projects go into the capital improvement plan and implementation. So I did want to spend a little bit of time talking about the, the wastewater collection system, and then I'm going to let Pam talk about the plant. Um, 
But basically, uh, your wastewater collection system is very uh, large. It's greater than 110 miles of gravity and force main, um, over 2,500 sewer manholes, and seven wastewater pumping stations. I have to say, there's a community that I did a similar plan for that had, I think, the most pump stations in the state, but they had about 51 pump stations. So, to me, to me, that's a that's a result of a of a collection system not being very well planned out. But I think it's also a result of Northampton being had a nice natural relief, you know, from the west to the to the river. So I think that's also another reason why you have a few amount of pump stations. Um, this does include the leachate pump station at the uh, landfill, and then the city obviously owns and operates their own wastewater treatment plant. So we looked at age um, and, and age of the system. Uh, we had a pretty good debate at the beginning of the project whether age is a good indicator of an issue or not, because you know, you might think a, you know, a, a brick pipe that was put in the 1800s was just by default going to be old and, and terrible. Brick actually holds up pretty well. In fact, in Boston, wood, wood pipes actually hold up pretty well too. So, you know, you really can't just say an old pipe's going to be a problem. Um, and just on the, conversely, you can't say a young pipe's not going to be a problem. So you have to really uh, take age with a grain of salt. Um, but what we did look at was what percentage of the collection system today along the, the main trunk lines is beyond 75 years, which we're just kind of using that as a general rule of thumb for, for considering the service life of a pipe. Uh, different manufacturers will tell you different durations of pipe depending on you know its material and, and stuff like that. But we're just going to use 75 for this discussion. Um, by the end of the planning period, so by 2035, we're going to see about 35% of the system will be beyond that 75 year. So it, it's an aging <coughs> it's an aging collection system. But again, that doesn't necessarily mean that there's an issue. We did look at about 20% of the, the manholes in the collection system. Um, we, we opened them, we had them inspected. We found that generally they were in decent condition, fair to, fair to good condition. Uh, we really uh, didn't see a lot of hydrogen sulfide or corrosion issues, uh, which can be um, problematic in some systems. We did find grease was a big issue in, in, a, lot of system, in a lot of the manholes. Um, and then with the pump stations, the only pump station we didn't visit was the Bradford Street pump station because basically that was brand new. Um, that project had just been finished up when we were getting started. Um, but the remaining pump stations, which are not, none of them are as big as Bradford Street, uh, were in, in fair to good condition. We thought that the mechanical portion was actually pretty good, like the pumps are well maintained, the motors are well maintained, the capacity seems okay. Um, but it was really things more about alarms, telemetry, controls that uh, made us a little nervous. Um, one of the the big issues is that the phone lines that the alarms were being sent to the treatment plant were, uh, were very staticky and, and quite problematic and the utility was not uh, being very forthcoming and helpful to replace those lines or help solve problems. So the city's actually already gone ahead and they're looking at putting, I think it's a radio system, is that right, at the, at the stations, um, to do more of a remote monitoring. So uh, hopefully that'll resolve some of the, the big concerns of the pump stations uh, that are, exist today. And then pipe condition, um, so the city owns its own CCTV equipment. Uh, CCTV is uh, closed circuit television, so basically they put a camera inside a pipe and they can take a look at, uh, you know, is it letting groundwater in, is it sagging, is it structurally failed, uh, those kinds of things. Um, and they, so they log these inspections and they can basically use that information to help determine how they're going to rehab uh, certain parts of the system. Um, we did not have a scope item in the CWMP to basically look at the whole city's inventory of CCTV videos. Um, that is something that I, I, I think you know could be done or, or should be done is just getting a good assessment of the condition of the system. But uh, our understanding is that the condition is generally okay, and we, we're catching through this program you know things that, that need to be done. So. Um, in terms of the performance of the wastewater collection system, the only thing that we're talking about on this particular slide are the, the sanitary sewer overflows, which I mentioned. Since 2005, uh, the city has had 54 sanitary sewer overflows, which is quite a lot. And um, one overflow is pretty significant because it is considered a, a violation of the Clean Water Act. So that's something that the Department of Environmental Protection would you know, sit up and take notice of. I mean, if you really only had one in 10 years, you know, they're going to like be okay with that, but um, if you get enough and it becomes a recurring thing, they're going to start to, to take notice. Um, the city does report every SSO to the DEP that's required. Uh, there's a form that gets submitted. Um, what this slide does is actually looks at kind of statistically 
uh, SSOs you know, since 2005, how many per year, and then also what the origin or the cause of the SSOs were. So if, if going back to 2005, you might, if I average that across, you know, we might be looking at about five a year, something like that. Um, which I guess I'm not in a position to say whether that would be enough to trigger concern by the DEP or not. I and mean, I guess the city's not under a, a consent decree for SSO, so maybe not. <laughs> but um, the vast majority, in fact, only three SSOs out of the 54 have anything to do with wet weather events. In other words, if it's raining, a lot of water gets into the system, it causes backups and flooding on the streets. That's like the real red flag I think that DEP gets really concerned about is if you start seeing wet, wet weather related SSOs. So the city is pretty fortunate, actually. In fact, all three of those SSOs occur at the same location on Barrett Street. Um, so that be that becomes a pretty big focus point of collection system concerns for us. The remaining SSOs are related to uh, blockages, um, such as grease, which we talked about, um, towels and rags that come from the prison has been a problem in the past, which I think the grinder project might be done, so we might be we might be over the hump there. Um, pump station failures. Uh, and then structural issues such as pipe collapse and that kind of thing. So I'll turn this over to Pam. She's going to talk about the existing conditions of the plant. So we also did um, an analysis of the wastewater treatment facility and what things are looking like here today. Um, the wastewater treatment plant was originally built in the 1950s as a primary treatment facility where wastewater would come in and settle out and the liquid would be sent to the Connecticut River. Uh, in the 1970s, after the Clean Water Act, it was expanded to include uh, <coughs> preliminary screening as well as secondary aeration, and, um, biological treatment and secondary clarification and then disinfection before heading back out to the river. It was designed for 8.6 million gallons per day and the current um, flows are averaging about four and a half million gallons per day. Um, peak flows are above 20 million gallons per day. We don't have an exact number on that because the influent flow meter has a constriction. It only measures up to 20 million gallons per day, but we know it goes over that based on the, the readings, and you'll see an image of that um, later that will explain that. The plant was originally designed and is currently designed as a... Pam, you yes. just had a question. Yes. Those, those peak flows are generated by rain alone? Uh, yes, as far as we know. Okay. Inflow. Inflow. Inflow, yeah. Um, it was designed for con conventional biological oxygen demand removal and suspended solids removal. BOD, or biological oxygen demand, is generally a measure of the strength of the wastewater. So um, because the treatment plant discharges water to the Connecticut River, it is subject to the National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System permit. Um, it's administered and issued by EPA and um, in conjunction with Mass DEP. The current exp a permit expired in November of 2013, and the city is currently waiting for a draft permit to be issued. Um, we are not expecting any major permit changes with this new draft permit, nor in the next permit, which would, which would occur in five years after the issuance of the current permit that's being expected. However, future permits looking out further at a 10 to 20 year horizon are expected to have some nitrogen numeric limits in them. So operations at the plant will have to change a little bit to remove more nitrogen. Phosphorus, um, Maybe not in 10 to 20 years, but long term may be something that you guys will have to start facing and um, thinking about. So we did an evaluation of the treatment plant looking at what the needs would be over the next 20 years. We, we reviewed the existing conditions at the plant, in particular paying attention to permit compliance and treatment performance, as well as the age and condition of the equipment that's there and the performance of the equipment. Based on that evaluation, we developed a needs list for the treatment facility. And then from that, we identified, out, based on that, we identified alternatives to meet all those needs and then did an evaluation of the different alternatives. So this is the, an overview of the wastewater treatment plant. Um, it's on Hockenham Road, and Hockenham Road is up here in the upper left. Uh, are you going to 
feel that the other two is going to do this cool thing they have in PowerPoint now. So you've got to do it. Right to if you want. <laughs> and I got to over here. So we'll date points there. I'll point over here. And you can, whichever one's easier for you to see. Can you see it, Jim? Yeah, I think I know where <laughs> so the flow comes in um, through here and enters uh, the headworks grit and, and uh, processing. And then it flows up through an influent um, flume, which where uh, the flow meter is, and into primary clarifiers where solids settle out. Um, those primary sol solids are moved and the liquid um, comes up and is pumped through the intermediate pumps into the secondary uh, treatment system. This is the biological treatment tanks here. The flow comes up through the center channel into these tanks and then flows down here and then out the sides and is then flows into these secondary clarifiers where again more s solids are settled out. The flow comes um, alongside the gravity thickeners here and then through an effluent flow meter and then is combined with um, some liquid, uh, combined with chlorine that was um, put into the water from chlorine gas where it, the um, wastewater and the chlorine goes through this um, chlorine contact chamber before being discharged out to the Connecticut River. Uh, when the Connecticut River is high, sometimes effluent pumps are needed to pump the water out to the Connecticut River. Uh, and I just want to point out that this maintenance building here was on that picture you saw a few slides back with the, the metal <coughs> roof. And that's right here. The treatment performance uh, evaluation showed that the wastewater treatment facility is meeting current permits, it's doing well, um, and that flows have been relatively flat. There hasn't been a lot of growth in Northampton as far as population or, f or flow other than, um, other than wet weather flows. So um, plant performance is looking good. It's well below um, the flow requirement uh, limit of 8.6 million gallons per day. And BOD and TSS, remember that's uh, basically the strength of the wastewater. Um, the effluent is below 10 milligrams per liter, whereas the permit limit is 30 milligrams per liter for both TSS and BOD. So it's doing well. Um, again, this uh, flow, maximum daily flow is an estimated flow. Um, we don't really know what the peak flows are going into the plant. Uh, I'll also note that there was a special condition in the last permit that required that the treatment plant optimize new, uh, nitrogen removal um, without doing any uh, capital expenditure. So without spending a lot of capital funds, how could the plant optimize the removal of nitrogen through just process changes? And the city has met that permit uh, requirement. The condition assessment um, Next, went into, we went to the treatment plant. We took um, experts in different engineering fields and we actually toured the plant, spoke um, numerous times with uh, people that work there and um, assessed all of these different items for, for the condition and how it's affecting uh, workers at the plant. In particular, things we looked at included um, the health and safety of workers. We also looked at processes, the controls, the mechanicals and operations at the plant as well as the structural and architectural condition of the buildings. Um, the heating and ventilation and air conditioning was also looked at, the, the requirements and the, and the condition of the existing system, as well as the plumbing and electrical infrastructure. We also examined um, building code compliance at the wastewater treatment facility. After um, a review of the facility, and we had a list of all the assets that were reviewed, each asset was then rated for its condition, its performance, and its safety. So they were given um, uh, a rating just by the engineers kind of looking at it and say, okay, this looks in poor condition, this is a good condition. And then reviewing uh, that data in com combination with our review of the entire treatment plant and engineering, um, we used engineering judgment to develop an overall priority rating for each asset at the wastewater treatment plant. So this, the overall rating was not a sum or um, did not directly derive from the condition and performance and safety ratings, but those informed that overall priority rating that we ultimately um, gave the, the asset. Major findings of the condition assessment um, included numerous building issues. Uh, there were ventilation and gas monitoring needs throughout the facility. 
Um, there were some structural and architectural deficiencies, including a number, a couple of roofs that need to be um, redone. And there was also a general lack of storage and maintenance space that um, workers uh, discussed and also was evident based on where things were being stored. Some of the code issues were also identified. There were building and fire protection as well as electrical codes throughout the campus. Equipment at the treatment plant is on the aging side. Um, much of the equipment, many of the assets were in poor to fair condition, uh, but operational. I got somebody knocking. And some of the, uh, some of the equipment, the more recently uh, replaced equipment and whatnot was in good condition. Uh, some of it approaching the end of its design life and much of it by the end of the 20 year planning horizon will have reached or exceeded its design life. So when we developed recommendations on, on our list of priorities, we looked at mitigating risk and failure at the treatment plant of all the processes. We wanted to ensure the safety of workers and of the public around the treatment plant. Hello. Uh, it was important to maintain permit, uh, permit compliance and to protect water quality. Those two, last two are related, but I um, just wanted to put those both in there. In particular, Dave, before you vote, um, sure. one important item the plant is using uh, what the one process that we're recommending be changed is that the treatment plant is using chlorine gas right now for disinfection, which is a high hazard um, gas. It's a high high hazard way to disinfect. So we recommended a process change to a safer uh, process for disinfection. We also, as part of the comprehensive wastewater management plan, needed to do an on-site wastewater needs analysis. An analysis, in other words, uh, next slide, Dave. If we looked at the areas of town that are not sewered, that have septic systems, we needed to look at those to determine if continuing to use septic systems in those areas was a viable long-term alternative or if some other um, wastewater treatment um, needed to be used. So to do the assessment, we looked at a number of different things. Um, primarily, we looked at the condition of the existing septic systems that are out there. We looked at um, Title five inspection reports to determine how many septic systems have failed over the years and how frequently they're failing. Also, how frequently septic systems are being pumped out. Um, if it's something's being pumped out frequently, septic system, then that shows you that there might be an issue there. So that was another red flag. Um, then we also looked more at sort of the physical constraints of the site where septic systems are being located, such as the soil conditions, like how quickly um, can flow percolate through the soil, or how slowly, um, how, how deep is the groundwater in that location, and the size of any parcels where septic systems are located. If it's a very small parcel, such as at um, Laurel Park area, for instance, um, if there's a lot of septic systems and you have poor soil conditions, that could lead to problems for the environment. So based on that initial needs analysis, we then um, interview city officials and people who designed and installed septic systems in the area to get a better understanding of sort of what was happening with septic systems around the city and areas where there might be problems that we need to pay attention to. We also looked at zoning and planning goals uh, to determine whether or not the city was planning to really develop a particular area that didn't have a sewer system that might need a sewer system. Finally, we looked at um, environmental conditions around all those areas. Are there sensitive um, environmental resources or are there drinking water wells in those areas that could cause a particular problem or issue if the um, septic systems were failing? After all that analysis, we developed uh, a map of the city that included pri um, sort of categorizing each area into different um, study areas. And we, we uh, knocked off didn't look at, obviously, where it was sewered, so the sewered areas were not considered, and that's, I guess, kind of a whitish-yellow color. Um, and protected land is in green. Um, and then other areas that are in gray were determined not to have any sewer needs, like there, there's no sewer need, septic systems either aren't there, or there's no developments there, or it's just not something we consider further. But the remaining areas we um, rated as low, high, or, or even moderate, um, needs as far as condition of the soils based on the previous um, analysis that we did. So this is kind of what it looks like in the city. There were just a few area, high need areas that were identified. How bad are they? 
Uh, what's the degree of need? Um, there was there were no like, oh my gosh, we have to do something about this right away. There was nothing alarming that we identified. There were some areas of need, but nothing that. Yeah. Basically, at the end of the day, it's 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 a desktop study with some you know real world information with you know city knowledge, poor health knowledge, and and solar knowledge, but. To our knowledge, there's no water quality degradation. There's no public health issues. You know, those are the kinds of things that would be like we need to sort this instantly. Um, so even though we we called something a high need, um, we're not recommending sewer extensions to those areas. Really, what it is 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 those areas were predominantly smaller lots. So the the opportunity to put a well functioning, well sized system is smaller in those areas than some other areas. But to our knowledge and, and to the city's knowledge, there's not you know chronic widespread issues with those systems. So what we like to say is that you know the, the individual installer and the individual owner of that system maintains responsibility for you know if there's an issue they'll, they'll fix it. So we're not suggesting that the city providing public you know extension or like that to those areas. We've been contacted on and off by um, Laurel Park. Mm -hmm. Yep. And. It's interesting because when we were doing this study, we tried to distribute a questionnaire to get specific information from them, which we couldn't get. And then when we were done this with this part of the section, they contacted us looking for some information in the report. And we had a little, a couple of emails back and forth with them. And we did offer to meet and share the information that we have, but that, um, it's been a while, it's been a few months, I think, since I had any contact with them or anything. So I haven't really heard anything from them in a few months. But we offered to, to at least share information that we had yep. um, because I, I guess they're grappling with, um, you know, whatever they have their issues there with something systems. That, that area we did um, look at in the alternative analysis phase. We looked at a variety of ways that that could be sewered, whether it's with a uh, low pressure sewer system, a gravity system with a uh, wastewater treatment um, pump station at the base of the hill, basically. Um, and we looked, I think we looked at a possibility of connection north to Hatfield, right? Um, so those costs were looked at and developed, uh, but ultimately we're not recommending anything be done today, you know, to that, to that system. Um, but that's just more for information. So for the city's future use and t discussions with Laurel Park, that information is available. Is Laurel Park, is that a, a, like condo or homeowners association? Do they all share? Or does each little cottage have its own? I think it's like a homeowners association. Yeah. 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 And of the, the of the two patches of orange there that show high, mm -hmm. I mean, it looks like the the part of the southern part of the map there. That's really a lot of new development in that region. So and those are large lots. Those aren't small lots. I know. So they're they're they are large lots. Like they would in where I live in Cambridge, those are huge lots. <laughs> yeah. for, for Northampton, those are relatively small. Uh, but oh, yeah. no, I don't think that's true. I mean, uh, no, Winterberry and Maple Ridge. Those Maple are Ridge? by our yeah. standards. Those are <coughs> yeah. Those are large lots. The lo small lots are are Laurel Park, <laughs> and then and then some of the development along Coles Meadow. But right. Laurel, but Maple Ridge and uh, and Winterberry are large lots that were that are all easily in excess of three quarters, if not more. Yeah, I, an acre. I would say relative to the unsured areas of town, so the 44 study areas we looked at, they're on the smaller side, but when you're in the sewers parts of the system, you'll find much smaller parcels for sure. Yeah, I mean, there's yeah. options there because of the size of those lots, but yes. at the same time, when those were developed, they were, there was a lot of marginal soils up there, so it was, I think that may be more mm -hmm. indicative of the what the source of the problem is rather than the size of the lots. Yep. So, mm -hmm. okay. Yep, I think that's the one. Okay, so I was going to take over uh, on II. So I did talk briefly about infiltration inflow and you know what what that can cause in terms of capacity issues and potentially SSOs in, in some collection systems. Um, so this this study is a is a fairly uh, rigorous study. Uh, DEP has uh, guidelines on how uh, an II study should be conducted. It basically involves uh, splitting the collection system into a lot of sub areas. I think we broke it into. 28 or 29 sub areas, if I remember right. We also had a study, um, uh, we also studied Williamsburg, the flow that comes into the city through Williamsburg, uh, to see if we could characterize II through them. Um, but for 10 weeks, 
in between April and June 2011, we installed uh, 32 or 33 temporary flow meters in the collection system, uh, and we basically analyzed the flow data that came out of it. Um, so what we're trying to do is actually quantify, so we'll actually be able to tell you in, in gallons per day per inventory sewer the system has, and also a million gallons uh, for inflow, we're trying to tell you how much water comes into the system due to groundwater, snowmelt, rainfall. And um, basically, we have those study areas and we prioritize them where we rank them from like worst to the best. And the DEP has some specific thresholds, uh, which, which we'll, we'll call them out a little bit later, but basically, if the infiltration exceeds a certain quantifiable amount, the idea is that it's, it's cost effective to actually pay a contractor to go in there, re rehabilitate the pipes, as opposed to letting the collection system uh, drain it to the treatment plant and pump it and treat it at the plant. Um, and then on the um, inflow side, the DEP has a certain threshold that says 80% um, you know, of all the flow that comes in through one storm should be attempted to be removed from the system, which is a pretty high amount. And I don't know, if, I don't know how they got to that number, to be honest with you. So schematically, this is kind of what a, a I guess a, a flow curve might look like for wastewater. <coughs> it really has three components. Um, infiltration is, is steady. I mean, throughout the course of a year, it'll seasonally go down a little bit in the summertime, and in the, in the you know, springtime it'll be higher seasonally. Uh, we did our study in the springtime, so we can try to capture infiltration sort of that's greatest throughout the year. Um, but over a short period of time, so over the, over the course of our study, 10 weeks, we really don't expect infiltration to change a heck of a lot. It's pretty steady over a short period of time. The orange is actual sanitary use. So when we shower, when we flush the toilets, when we use the sink, this is kind of a you know, classic pattern. We call it a diurnal pattern of what sewer use looks like, where in the morning you'll see a little bit higher use when everybody's showering, having breakfast, getting ready for work or school. In the middle of the day, there might be a little bit of a drop off. Yes? One, two, three, four, five, what are those signified days? Days, yeah, yeah. yeah. Tip up the day. Yeah, exactly. Um, and then in the evening, you might see a little bit more of a bump up in flows, and then at nighttime, you know, basically almost no flow. So this generally repeats itself over the course, you know, over the course of the day. And then the green would be the impact of, of inflow coming to the system, which again generally is, is from related to rainfall events. So inflow can be broken into two categories itself. There's direct inflow and indirect inflow. So the direct inflow, you actually would see impact over a very short span of time. So it really only impacts a few hours. But its impact is great because it really generates a huge peak flow. And this peak flow, uh, when, when it rains in Northampton, you'll see it in the treatment plant within 30 minutes to an hour. I mean, it's really fast. Um, but that's, this inflow then will continue to be an issue over the next you know, three, four, five days where um, rainwater is going to get into the ground. It can temporarily raise the groundwater table, which actually is, is sort of a, a hybrid infiltration. It's called rain-induced infiltration. And then there's also um, inflow from sump pumps. So, you know, the, so properties will capture inflow in their basements and they'll pump them. And sometimes they're improperly plumbed to the sewer system. I'm not saying that's the case in Northampton, but I'm just saying generally that can happen. So you might actually see over, over a long period of time, you might see inflow still impacting flows in the system. So what we found was uh, on the infiltration side, actually pretty positive results to be honest with you. I, I've done this in you know, half a dozen communities and I think Northampton actually had one of the better results, um, except for a system that was like put in the 80s, that was pretty good. But um, basically only one sub area uh, down here, the Milton Street sub area was the only one that exceeded the DEP threshold of 4,000 gallons per day per inch diameter mile. Um, I'll, let me define that, what that is. So inch diameter mile is basically uh, the inventory of how much pipe surface there is. So it's inch diameter, so a, you know, a 10 inch pipe times the length of it. So it kind of it gives you a rough idea of surface area. Um, so then system wide, so if you just average the whole system over the course of the event that we an analyzed, is about 1,700 gallons per day per inch diameter mile, which is pretty good. Um, but the interesting thing is, is that during the spring season, so again, we, we did this during the worst infiltration period of the year, we found that 42% of the dry weather flow was related to infiltration. It's pretty high. That's pretty high. Um, but again, 
if you just strictly use the DEP threshold of 4,000, we can we can allow that to happen. I mean, it's you know it's not good, but we can allow it to happen. Uh, we can allow it to happen because it's not cost effective to do anything. That would be the theory, it. yeah, okay. yeah, that it's it's more expensive to try to remove right. it than it is to deal just, with it. just deal with it at the plant. Um, on inflow, so we so the rainstorm that we looked at had 2.4 inches of rain, uh, which is a you know fairly sizable. We don't get that all the time, um, and that produced about 11 million gallons of flow, uh, which is about two and a half days worth of flow over the course of I think it was a 13 hour storm. So over 13 hours, the plant got two and a half days worth of flow. So that's a pretty big ratio of flow. Um, that's the kind of thing that's going to make the flow meter go to 20 MGD plus. You know, we don't really know, you know, what the actual flow is beyond that. Um, we found that the King Street area, um, which is designated area, sub area 102, had the highest inflow. And this uh, historically has been determined by other engineers studying inflow in, in Northampton to be the case. I think Whitman Howard did a study, I want to say in the 70s or 80s. And yeah, early 90s. Early 90s, okay, sorry. They basically found this almost the same exact thing that we did with that. This in, that King Street area is, is sort of a, you know the big, the big money spot for inflow in town. So just graphically looking at infiltration, the Milton the Milton Street area, right in the, the middle there is the red one. That's the only one that was above 4,000. Um, the yellows are. How would that be? Just out of curiosity. That's a good question. I mean, we didn't really follow that up with CCTV, but that would be the next natural step. Would be to camera it and take a look at it and see if there's leaky joints and, and that kind of thing. To be honest with you, that, I mean, we didn't follow up on it, so. Um, that would be, a recommendation of the study is to do follow-up work to, to come back. Generally, generally, it's like an older part of town. There's a lot of, there's a lot of clay pipe there, so. Clay pipes in Michigan, yeah. a lot more susceptible to infiltration than old pipes. Yep. Leaky, so. That whole brickyard area up there is high water table. Yeah, mm -hmm. so that mm -hmm. the combination is yeah. the water table. The old Carney Brook and all that yeah. stuff. Yeah. But it's, it's still, I mean, it's, it's, like maybe it, it, it's close to the center of the city, and maybe everything mm -hmm. ends up there. I mean, yeah. I was just curious. Yeah, yeah, no. I guess I am too. <laughs> all right, so, um, yeah, move on, Pam. So for infiltration, I guess the, the take home message is that infiltration is generally low throughout the city, which is a good thing. Um, you know, and the cost to remove it, you know, may not be cost effective to spend a lot of effort removing infiltration specifically. So. Uh, with inflow, so again, the, as I mentioned before, the, the DEP would recommend that about 80% of the inflow that's observed through a particular storm be targeted for removal. So. You know, we found 11 million gallons through that 2.4 inch storm. So in theory, we'd be looking to remove, you know, whatever, eight, eight to nine million gallons of flow. Those eight to nine million gallons were, came from 12 different sub areas. So King Street is the one in red, and that was the worst. Um, more, than one, more than one million gallons, so 10% of that flow came from just that one area. Um, the yellow areas is where the, the middle parts, so half, half a million to a million gallons, came out of the yellow areas, and then the green areas were, you know, less than half a million gallons came out of there. And the gray areas um, were, you know, the remaining 20% basically came from there. So we kind of, those sort of fall off the table in terms, in terms of interest. So we did mention that um, Pam had alluded to this figure. So this, this is a chart recorder of flow coming into the wastewater treatment plant. This is physically what it looks like uh, July 23rd, 2013. So this is after our II study. But um, Jim Zimmerman, I think, sent us this photograph where it literally goes off the chart. So the very top line would be your 20 million gallons per day of flow. And you know you can kind of maybe project where it's going to connect. You know, um, And I think estimates in the past have, have said maybe something like that would be 22 MGD. So hydraulic capacity assessment, this was uh, kind of a follow-on to the II study. We were able to use the data from the II study to uh, develop and calibrate a computer-based hydraulic model um, to basically look at a variety of conditions. So we wanted to look at, during dry weather conditions, how does the collection system perform? During wet weather conditions, how does the collection system perform? And under wet weather conditions, we looked at a variety of storm events. We looked at the um, April uh, storm event from 2011, we looked at a uh, 
two year storm event, a five and a 10 year storm event. So we basically ran a lot of different scenarios and this is the output of the model from the existing conditions, two year storm event. And we found um, not a lot of areas that jumped out at us. I mean, really, again, it's not bad. I mean, there's not a lot of chronic issues with um, capacity problems. And probably half the things that our model said are an issue, we actually don't have real world validation that says it is in fact an issue, which, which, is, um, which is good. So what we did was we looked at the SSO charts from 2005 on and we said, well, does our model like match up with any of those? But if you remember, those were mostly blockages and not so much wet weather capacity issues. And then we actually, the city opened up a bunch of manholes, especially along Prospect Street and State Street, um, where the two longest reaches were. And we tried to see, you know, are there, is there um, debris like hung up on ladder rungs? Is there any evidence that there's surcharging happening? Sometimes you'll see um, debris on the, the brick uh, channel, or the shelf rather, of the, of the manhole bottom. Um, the feedback was that there really wasn't a lot of, you know, a lot of that. So we basically, even though the model is showing some issues there, um, you know, we're kind of putting our blinders on temporarily for those two areas. But Barrett Street did pop up, and we found um, along Market and Holly a couple spots that did have some validation that that made us feel comfortable in the model there. So you kind of have to, you know, use a bit of judgment with the model, even though it, it calibrated very nicely. We just felt, um, particularly the Prospect and the and the State Street, um, were not the, the you know worth spending a lot of time or you know, investment in, so. I think I covered this already. All right, so future conditions. Um, so, I want to advance the slide. So we looked at um, existing conditions, as Pam said, we have about four and a half million gallons a day, annual average of flow of the plant. And what we did was we looked at a few things. So the sustainable Northampton plan was sort of the, the long-term master plan um, for the city. It basically says the areas that are not sewered, there's not really a lot of desire to sewer them, there's a lot of desire to expand the system. Uh, they really want to redevelop and, and use more intelligently the areas that are developed and have a sewer system. So we kind of had that in the back of our minds looking at this. We also looked at uh, population projections. So um, uh, I believe it's uh, uh, UMass does the miser projections, I believe. Um, we looked at those, we looked at uh, Pioneer Valley uh, projections and it basically showed fairly flat. It didn't really show a lot of huge growth anticipated population-wise. But even still, if you look at the way that the, that the city is, the, the areas that are developed are zoned, there is some room for subdevelopment, um, for infill, which would be to like occupy properties that are currently unoccupied. Plus, we did have knowledge of some particular developments that had planned to go in that had a potential for a certain amount of flow. So, so we looked at, basically, you can call that a build-out type scenario. Um, and we looked at, we, we saw about 30, uh, opportunity for about 30% growth, which um, if you look at the EOEA did build out analyses for every town and city in Massachusetts, uh, this is substantially less than that kind of an analysis. So we felt comfortable that it was, it was defensible based on information that we had, but it wasn't so extravagant that you know, it was gonna cause a lot of issues. So it's sort of a middle of the road type approach. Um, so 5.8 MGD in the future, dry weather flow capacity, that's still, you know, significantly less than the 8.6 MGD that the plant's designed for. So we don't really anticipate that future growth to be a problem. And similarly, the plant's designed to remove the pollutant loading of BOD and TSS, you know, up to 8.6 MGD. So it should be able to handle um, pollutant loading related to that additional flow. Um, and it should be able to continue to handle all the industrial flow that we have in, in the system today. Um, so I do want to point out, you know, wet weather flows we know are problematic today. When you do increase your base flow by you know 30 percent, those wet weather issues are going to become all the more problematic. And then also, um, in the planning window, as Pam had mentioned, we do have to think about a, a nitrogen permit limit. Uh, you know, the population growth and, and looking at the zone doesn't really impact that so much, but that is something that we can't ignore. Is that there could be something on nitrogen? All right, Pam, do you want to take it over yeah. from here? Sure. All right. <coughs> So I already described um, sort of how we rated the wastewater treatment facility and gave different numbers to the condition to sort of give us an idea of the priorities of projects and the importance of projects at that facility. Um, after we did the collection system work, we also we did a numeric uh, prioritization of them based on 
risk, lo looking at the risk of failure and consequences of failure in that system. Next slide, Dave. So uh, using a risk assessment is something that utility owners are increasingly doing throughout the United States. Um, it's helpful in decision making because it provides a transparent process that gives you a quantitative metric that you can use to rank different assets and projects. Um, and it allows you to focus capitals, your capital spending on those most important projects. Um, basically, two, two questions are asked. If an asset is to fail, what's the consequence of that asset failing? And the other one is, what is the, what's the probability that that asset would fail? And those two are combined to give us a, an overall risk rating for that asset. This is uh, an, just a conceptual idea of how that works. On the y-axis, we have the probability of failure. You'd have a, a number from on that axis, and you'd also have a number on the consequence of failure axis down here on the x-axis. And it, intuitively, if you have something that has a high probability of failure, and the consequence of it failing are both high, then you know that that's a high risk asset. So that's something that you're gonna need to prioritize in your planning. Um, if you have something that's got a high probability of failing, but the consequence of the failure isn't too high, you're gonna put that maybe as a second, <coughs> second priority on your list, um, sort of ranking it below the high risk items. Um, if you have an asset that has a high consequence of failure, like it would be really, really bad if it <coughs> failed, the probability of it failing is pretty low, that's an item that you're going to want to keep well maintained and monitor it uh, in an ongoing basis. So it really kind of helps put these assets into different categories and help you sort of lay them out in a different way. And um, you know, it makes sense then that your low risk, low probability of failure, low consequence of failure, that's going to be low risk low-risk assets that you don't need to spend a lot of time and money on. So in the collection system, um, each segment of SOAR that was examined was, was ranked for a probability of failure and consequence of failure to develop a risk rating. And this is just a, a, a visual of how that all played out. Items in green uh, were, were considered to be low-risk assets, moving through uh, yellow and orange and up to red were the areas that were the assets that were considered to be higher risk assets owned by the city. Once we had uh, these rankings for the wastewater treatment plant and for the collection system, um, we had to develop uh, alternatives that would address all the issues that were identified and all the needs that were identified. And then once those alternatives were um, created, we had to you know, rank them and identify some some way, some plan for the city to move forward with, with those projects. Uh, just to remind you at the wastewater treatment facility, almost every part of the campus required some sort of, uh, had some need, requires some sort of um, fixing or maintenance in the next 20 years. Uh, these are kind of laid out conceptually here. I didn't point out earlier that the, the plant is highly constrained. Um, it has a railroad track down here. I think that's actually the, the western edge. And then right along the other edge is a, uh, is a stream, so you can't really expand out that way. So you're very constrained in where you can put things at the wastewater plant. Um, major findings at the collection system included um, needs at the pump stations, and particularly in communications. Um, and over the long-term um, condition as well. High inflow in certain areas that we just discussed, and there were also some high-risk sewers, as we mentioned. So for each of these uh, needs areas, uh, we developed projects that would address those major findings. And each project was kind of ranked, um, or, or, well, we, add, we developed criteria for each project to say, you know, how, does this, if, does this project to meet this need have, does it meet safety needs, does it meet the condition needs, and does it meet, um, you know, permit needs at the plant or elsewhere in the system? And then for the alternatives that made sense to carry forward um, a little bit further, we developed capital costs and life cycle costs. We didn't do that for every project, just the ones that made sense. And we helped, uh, that cost data helped us in the next step of selecting some of those preferred alternatives. At the wastewater treatment facility, um, 
most of the projects were grouped, uh, had, had alternatives in these categories. We always had a do-nothing approach. Okay, what if we don't do anything here? If we just leave it, don't include it in the capital plan, what, what would happen? How, how does that play out compared to all the others? Uh, rehabilitating, rehabilitating the existing infrastructure was, was considered, as well as upgrading the, the existing and also replacing with new. So each particular process or tank um, was, had alternatives within these categories. And ultimately, the projects that fell out of all that um, basically could be lumped into um, four different categories. In green, we have sort of building code, um, building space and usage, you know, and anything related to buildings and, and space is kind of in green here. Um, the blue is sort of all the liquid, the liquid treatment trains, treating the liquid as it comes through and um, disinfecting it and all that. The yellow is sort of the solids part of the campus, and everything in the salmon colored is more um, <coughs> the ancillary uh, support services at the treatment plant that all that are important and the electrical um, is critical. So they're all um, basically add up using 2014 dollars as the baseline. The total capital costs are estimated to be a little over 56 million dollars over the um, full 20 years. We did a similar exercise for the collection system alternatives. Um, there were uh, different alternatives based on what the needs were in each of the areas that we identified. So um, not all of these were considered for each project, but depending on what the project was, it got a different subset of these alternatives. Again, we looked at a do-nothing approach. We looked at resizing the existing sewers, uh, maybe constructing a relief sewer, or reconfiguring the collection system in that area. We also considered, okay, what if we just rehabilitate the system, or how do we um, eliminate inflow or infiltration? And finally, uh, for the pump stations, we looked at what if we eliminate the pump station or replace it or just modify it. So um, looking at all of those projects, they, they generally grouped into three general categories. Again, we had um, sewer system evaluation surveys and infiltration and inflow removal projects about $10 million, um, those are in green. Um, collection system improvements, again, a little over $14 million for <coughs> general collection system improvements. And the pump stations, uh, estimated cost for those is about $6 million, again, in 2014. So now that we have a list of projects and general priorities, um, we needed to come up with a way of sort of planning them out and combining them because we have the collection system and we have the wastewater treatment plant and how, how are we going to put all that together and come up with a plan to move forward. So the first thing was to <coughs> prioritize the capital improvement plan, to so really take the, the projects that have the highest need, whether it's at the treatment plant or in the collection system, and put them together and prioritize that list. Um, the next step was developing schedule for the first five years, so we worked closely with um, <coughs> Jim on sort of honing in on what's cri what critically needs to be done. What do we have to do in the next five years? What are the most important projects to do? Um, the next thing was to identify some funding sources and think about how these projects are going to be funded. Um, finally, you got to, not finally, but the next step is to implement that five year capital improvement plan, start doing the work. And then after five years, as Dave mentioned this earlier, it's really important to kind of revisit your list, remaining list of priorities. Um, in five years, things may have shifted, conditions may have changed, permit conditions may be different. So it's a, in five years, you're going to want to kind of relook at your prioritized list and maybe move some things around depending on what's happening out in the field and the ground. So looking at the five-year schedule, um, the most important projects that were identified were all at the wastewater treatment facility. They were generally broken up into three different projects, um, starting um, in year one and moving to year five um, spread out so that they could be grouped into, into manageable projects. Um, similarly, the collection system, um, this, was, this is basically pump station projects beginning with design in year five. So all of these projects total about $30 million. We looked at uh, funding options for these projects. Yes, 
очень добрая. Mm -hmm. So I thought we picked 18 million for the budget. The, the budget that you worked on with the mayor to come up with funding for the first five years? First five years were, I thought about 28 million. Oh, 28. Okay, oh, that makes more sense because then the collection system would add just a little, a little more. Yeah. Okay, all right. Thank you. So throughout, um, most communities fund many of their wastewater collection system and treatment plant projects through the sewer enterprise fund. Um, some communities use fees to help fund projects such as betterments and sewer connection fees or charging developers fees. Um, those aren't really going to be an option in Northampton because um, <coughs> I don't believe developers are charged fees here. and. Betterments and sewer connections, we're not recommending an extension of the sewer system, so that would not be an option. Um, general fund could be used to fund projects, but then you'd be up against school funding for schools and food and fire and other general community needs. So using that sewer enterprise fund is, is generally the preferred alternative. Um, municipal bonds are possible for funding, for funding projects. Um, Northampton has a good rating. So actually, very good rating. So you could get a, a, a good deal on a municipal bond, good, good interest rate on that. Um, and another, other popular ways to fund projects are through grant or loan programs. Um, in particular, the ones listed here: the Clean Water State Revolving Fund, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, and MassWorks. Of those, um, the Clean Water State Revolving Fund is really the most popular fund. You can get a two percent loan through that. Um, with that fund, there's definitely um, a lot of administration and um, other fees and um, administration involved in that in receiving funds. So there's other state requirements that you have to adhere to in order to use those funds. There is one project that um, would qualify for FEMA money, and that is, a, I don't remember the name, is that along the Mill River? Yes, yeah, retaining yeah. wall project. There's a retaining wall project that could qualify for FEMA funds along that river. It's not common for FEMA funds to be used for sewer projects, but. No. We found that, uh, actually Ned is the one who brought this to our attention during the study, but uh, one of the major interceptors that falls along the Mill River is, is basically the slope that that's built into is held up by this retaining wall. So if you saw undermining or erosion or degradation of that wall, and if the whole slope were to slide a bit, that whole sewer <coughs> could also go with it. So we wanted to uh, identify that. And actually, I understand that same exact project was identified, I think, by C.M. Smith in the stormwater plan also. So it is kind of a... Stormwater, it's, it's generally a stormwater thing, but in our case, it's a sewer concern too, so it's highlighted in both studies. Yes, Ned. That also helped us with the FEMA grant we received for River Road. Yeah. Because Williamsburg's interceptor is behind that wall. Yeah, yeah. Somebody else? Here? And I think, do we have more? I'm just going to point with Mass with MassWorks, that's really geared towards economic development and job growth, and again, in some in some in some situations, it can be used for sewer extensions. So if you had a um, like a business park or industrial area that was under, being underutilized because it wasn't sewered, and say you you extend a sewer to it, now all of a sudden you know you got more commercial and industry and all that stuff. MassWorks could potentially be a candidate for that. But again, our our findings are that we don't really need to extend sewers that much. I don't think any of our recommendations are really going to make huge economic gain in the city. So. Massworks is, is probably not viable or, or an opportunity for the city in this particular case, but I just want to point that out. So in summary, um, there's about $87 million in funds if you look at 2014 dollars. Um, the five-year plan has about $30 million of needs in it. The focus of that five-year plan is on the wastewater treatment facility and the pump stations. The capital improvement plan for the years 6 through 20, like so looking out beyond to the 20 year planning horizon, there's about $57 million in 2014 fund uh, money. Uh, it's really important that that schedule be revisited after the five year CIP um, because there are, there are definitely a number of moving targets on that list, including the nitrogen removal project, um, any sewer system evaluation uh, work that gets done over the next five years could inform. Um, some of those priorities in the collection system. 
and the King Street sewer replacement, something might shift in that project as well. So those are just, that's just a list, uh, but there may be other projects that uh, be become highlighted or other parts of the system that become high need over the next five years. Are all of those, those three projects included in the 57 million? Yes. Yeah, so I think I, I think the point of this is really um, to emphasize the need to revisit the CIP after five years. Because basically what we're saying is just in these three projects alone, there's $32 million of sort of, we're not really fully committed to these projects. You know, things could change. Maybe the city never gets nitrogen removal permit. You know, those, those are the kinds of things that we identify needs and potential ways to resolve those needs. But they really need to be revisited in the future because we can't, you know, we can't cement today that those really need to be done. <coughs> Uh, you mentioned uh, the possibility of getting rid of liquid chlorine. Seems to me there was a big study done right after I got tired uh, putting in uh, hyperchloride. And for some reason or other, they didn't go that way. Have you talked to the staff about that? About why they didn't? Well, we, we, have, we have talked to the staff about changing from gas to liquid. And uh, they can't wait for it. They want us to do it as fast as possible. They did at uh, that time too. It, but it had something to do with the size of the tanks. And so no, I, I, you know, John Carver and Jim Zimmerman during, during the, the, this whole process, they never said anything to us about a prior study or any difficulties in, in looking at that years, you know, years ago. Yeah. I'm, not a, I'm not aware of uh, I'm not aware of anything. But it's a priority and it's a project that we have planned coming up here in, in the near term. It was a priority when I was there, too. <laughs> but, uh, okay. I didn't know what uh, what stopped it before. Yeah. I don't know anything about that. So, any other questions? Is, it, is the, um, and the, the five-year capital improvements plan, is the, is there general awareness of the fact that, I mean, I think there is, uh, certainly awareness. Is there awareness to the extent that there's been any projections made in the capital improvements plan for uh, uh, bringing in to, to some of these recommendations uh, as it presently exists? Or is this, is this a five-year capital improvements plan as yet to be formulated? We actually presented it to the mayor and Susan White as part of the budget process this year. All these projects are looking to start in FY17, at least the bonding of them are. So um, we're still looking at moving this forward. The big goal right now is to get this out to the public and show that these are the needs and this is what we're planning to do. Uh, Anne Marie uh, Levy actually did some rate projections of what this would look like. And we're basically looking at <coughs> two, to three, uh, two, maybe three percent, a little higher rates of that five-year planning period because of this. Each so, year? Mm -hmm. Yes. Right. So compound it over five years. Yeah. Right. So like the, one of the, we looked at the examples in the budget and basically there was a, a 1.3 million in funded in FY17, 3.4 million on a 10-year bond in FY18, then there was a couple 15-year bond issuances in 19 and 20 for about uh, 17 million dollars and uh, the last ones were the C2 pump stations as they're called uh, projects which were 10 year bonds of about um, six million dollars. We have we have had discussions with the mayor's office about the about these projects in this five year CIP that Klein was talking about. Um, he's, I would say that his understanding of the need at the plant um, we did start looking at what it would take to pay for these projects, but the mayor hasn't committed to the rate increases necessary to make the projects happen. I think this year it was a 0% rate increase, and I think that he wants to better understand the five-year plan and what it is that we're proposing to do to be a little more comfortable with it. So I think we're working with him on that. And then the other part of it is the mayor's very concerned about affordability and how people, what, what is, if there's a series of projected rate increases for sewer and water combined, what is, what is the impact of affordability for people in the city? So he's, he was very cautious. I think we were, 
happy that he's supportive and he seems to understand sort of the dire need of the wastewater plan. But how to pay for it is very important. And um, I think to that end, we're looking at rate options and um, the mayor's asked us to work with the company to look at different rate structures for the water and sewer enterprise funds to look at what um, different ways of setting up rates might be or different ways to do rate relief for low income people or seniors or, or whatever the case may be. So there's, there's a lot more scouring over rate impacts and what the effects will be. So it's the biggest thing that, that we talk about with, with client builders, we, we see the need because that's our job and then sort of the ability to pay for the improvements then ends up being really important in trying to make those mesh. The five-year projects are the ones that Kleinfeld has really said, and, and we know if you go down the plan, you talk well, you can talk to Jim, but if we go down and talk to the operators, you take a look around, these are things that really are long, long overdue. So the five-year stuff is like the things that we know that need to happen, and, then after, and it's a lot of money to get to that point. And that's why we're talking about at the end of five years or whatever, taking a look at a lot of the other needs that have been identified to see when we could take care of them or when we would be able to afford to take care of them. Whether over time there might be more state and federal money available to help with this sort of thing, we don't really know. But, um, it's really people. challenging coming on the, on the heels of the, of the stormwater management uh, impact on, on people just in terms of, of you know, uh, the, the practical side of it is, it is you know, uh, accepted by the community, but it's still green dollars for everybody, and it's got to be figured out uh, with that in mind. But I, one of the things that occurred to me is, is with your presentation that I wonder, it didn't really make sense to me on the basis of, of uh, uh, the 30% the growth figure. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, I think if we're going to be talking in, in public uh, discussions that is coming up in September, that's going to be hard for people to accept as a as a premise for going forward with a project such as this. I mean, that, I don't think that there's anything to support that I'm aware of to support that suggestion that we might be looking at 30% mm -hmm. growth as something that would be a reason for considering something as important as this. I, I really think. Uh, Look at that. I mean, uh, you can look back 50 years, and I don't think that the population has shown any, seen that, yeah. anything close to that, right, or, or right. even 3%, let alone, yeah. let alone yeah. 30%. I, I think that's sort of a red herring. I think right. all the costs that we're talking about are really to fix what we have. Yeah. And when you right. fix what you have, you might make it a little bigger, right. but most of the costs are to fix this thing that's falling apart around yeah. there. Around there. I, so, I, so maybe in the public presentation, I, I've got some other thoughts. There's some things we stay away from. Yeah. Let's yeah, focus on yeah. what's what's really important, and and we've got to work on that with you folks because what doesn't come across is what poor condition that is. You you, yeah. you made the comment that most of it's in poor to fair condition, but but the public needs to understand what that really means. And you had some good pictures, but mm -hmm. I mean that's I think that's the focus. We have to fix what we have. And yeah, we might make a few pieces a little bit bigger, but that's that's not why we're spending the money here. Right, yeah, it's a little bit, the 30% the number is, um, it's almost irrelevant to what we're doing. 30% number is sort of a check. If you have that amount of growth in the city, do you have adequate size? Is your equipment adequately sized at the treatment plant? The answer is yes. Are your sewers adequately sized? The answer is yes. So it's a check to make sure that if you had that sort of growth within the city, would it cause problems within your collection and treatment systems? So you go through that sort of check, and the, the answer is doesn't really wouldn't really cause any problems because the system's adequately sized to handle that growth. So that's more it's like a planning aspect at the very top to make sure that you don't have to go through and, and do a lot of upsizing of things. I think publicly yeah. it's going to be a tough sell, and I think that the that the earlier some of the earlier information suggested that the that the that the daily flow there is also that we're very adequately able to handle that. Mm -hmm. So if we talk about a, if we talk about capacity, mm -hmm. it sounds like we've got capacity, but we do have a deteriorating yeah. Yeah. building that needs an awful lot of attention. People can relate to that, but we've yeah. got to, I think that the, you're going to get some, some real pushback from the community if we start talking about things such as that that just don't ring yep. true. Yeah, the, the plant's designed for 8.6, and we said it was 4.5 now. Mm -hmm. and with that 30% growth, you'll be at 5.8. So you're, there's, you're still substantially less than what you have now, size-wise. Yeah. So I think the, the point of that, as, I guess, as Jim was saying, was sort of a, you know, you want to check that condition, but our findings from that is that it's not really driving any of the projects or anything like that. 
um, if, if, if the commission thinks it's best to really just not even talk about that, you know, in, in the next public, you know, hearing, that's fine. I mean, we can, we can indicate that it was done, but really de-emphasize it, you know, to some degree, so. I think Jim had us. You know, uh, when I started the first wastewater treatment plant in 1958, the population here in Northampton was 29,000 people. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> so where are we at today? So what are we at today? 29,000. 29, 29, That's the point. And yeah. I have said at every one of the planning department's projections, you're way off base because they'd use a 30 or 40 percent figure of growth. And I say, where the hell is it? It's it's not here. Belcher Town. Yeah. Gary, you had something. I did. So I uh, so it, uh, we're we're using two. We're using a bunch of different numbers, but I think it's going to be really important to say a number I don't think I heard. So the plant capacity is eight thousand. Eight million. Eight million. I'm sorry. Uh, the average is four four point five. Yeah. What is the peak flow? What is the peak? So. The, the plant size had to be some sort of peak flow something. Yeah, the peak flow. And so we're, we're talking about plant size. That's got to be the maximum it can take, and we're talking about average. What is the maximum that we've ever recorded? Do you remember oh, a day where it was like 6,000? Without a rainstorm. I mean, like, we really did handle oh, that a six, million gallon, 6 million gallons or something like that. That I'd have to talk to Jim about to look back in the records. Yeah, Jim, you know, you're, you're talking, uh, it's always average between three and four. Yeah. Yeah. You know. And 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 that's so the peak demand is five really days of the year. The peak demand is yeah. really driven by it's weather. weather driven. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. then that's the part that has to be understood. Yeah. And so you have really some great slides to show yeah. that. The uh, the plant capacity is designed for what, fourteen point seven NGD peak? I think that's close to that, yeah. Yeah. I think it's designed for almost So you're saying points. the average flow design is eight million. That's the average. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. I was thinking it was the peak. Yeah. So, so we are seeing peaks greater than 20, you yeah. know, which, which is higher than yeah. what's designed for. But that's for the storm. But that's wet weather. Right. Yeah, that's storm water. Yeah. Well. Okay. I, I have two points I want to make. One is we've learned with the storm water presentations <coughs> that having good pictures, as, as you mentioned before, is really critical. And over the past year before we, our role was a little bit minimized. We had some great stories about wastewater treatment plant and the problems and the machines and the um, you know the ability of the uh, to, of the uh, pump to go, that that goes into the, to the river. Those stories need to be at the public hearing, and we need to talk about those specific things. And we need to have pictures that go with them because mm -hmm. that's what really helped us with the stormwater. And that's what we've heard over the past year in terms of the critical aspects of, of the Now, those public hearings, did, did the city, I mean, did anyone from the city talk about those, or was that all just the consultants? Uh -huh. Yes, it was all city. It was all good. city. Yeah, no, that's, no, I think that's going to be a lot more impactful than, than us talking about it. That was a, that was a 10 minute video presentation. Was it? Yeah. Uh, yeah. By the staff. Uh, yeah, I mean that's that would be a lot more impactful than, than Pam or I talking about stories that you know that we heard about at the plant. You know, much better than people live through. No, yeah, but you can point out yes. the most significant issues that, yep. that you, I mean, you know, taking from here, you giving you're giving a summary, but you come across some really interesting stories because I know we've had them over the past year, about the mm -hmm. last probably two years. Yeah. Yeah. Which one? I mean, I really think that's a good point because a lot of it is in how, how well you sell it. And then uh, and I, I think at, at a certain point, however, you know, logic sets in if, if, if they can accept the, the concepts that are being uh, thrown out there. And uh, I thought that, you know, Terry did a wonderful job of that with the, with the stormwater management in a way that comforted people knowing yet not them knowing that they were gonna, it was going to be costing them money. We're talking here about 2 or 3% potentially compounded over, you know, that's pretty easy math for people to be able to do to figure out the impact uh, on them in, in terms of, of, of that cost. So they've 
got to be convinced that the uh, that we have an antiquated plan. I mean, I remember when Jimmy took me down there 20 years ago when I was on the council. He ran through the whole plant how we how everything was processed from from entry to going out the door and he says out to the river and he says and I can take a glass of water here and it, and, and drink it as it comes out he drinks it down and I said oh man, I can't believe it he had a full head of hair though then and I think that has a lot to do with it <laughs> really but I mean so I mean, it's that kind of those images yeah. yeah the public needs to be able to feel comfortable with this kind of expense, particularly, as I mentioned earlier, coming so closely on the heels of the stormwater management because, um, yeah, you know, I, mean, I, guess, I guess that's, we're doing our advisory thing now rather than the, the board thing that we used to do, but it seems to me that's, yeah. as, as Mike said, it's, it, we've got to really smooth out that presentation to the point where it mm -hmm. uh, makes sense to people, and because I think they generally buy it when they can see this, right. how mm -hmm. logical the presentation is, but 30% of some of these other things don't. Yeah should be, you know, culled out of that presentation from what you put forward to us tonight. I think there's a YouTube video of uh, John Carver tour touring the plant, right? There is. I think I discovered that one day. Yeah. Yeah. But I think he probably did it in a good light, though. <laughs> one of the things that uh, impressed me when the subcommittee met several times on this was that we looked at, especially at the wastewater plant, all the different projects and we we had to assign some level of priority to each of the projects and I don't think it was a project you could argue shouldn't be done today so what, what we did was we picked the, the ones of highest need and said well those are the high priority and then we have medium and low but I, those aren't probably the right it's like really high very high high you know <laughs> you just need to do them all and um, that's a that's a challenge. We're not done. We're not even close to being done after the first five years, because everything that we don't touch will be five years older. And and it's it's it as Jim said, it should have been taken care of by now. And, and so that's a real challenge. Um, the other concept that we struggled with um, is that ideally, you you'd look at a collection system and try to reduce the amount of rainwater inflow into the system before you started working on the treatment plant. Mm -hmm. But as we looked at um, sources of inflow, King Street, the King Street project is the big one and that's about a $10 million project Twelve. as I recall. Twelve. Twelve, okay, $12 million project. And it was just our sense that we, we, we couldn't begin to afford spending $12 million on King Street before we spend a dollar at the treatment plant because yeah. we're way behind at the plant as it is. So um, just so by, by financial necessity, we're approaching it perhaps not in the most ideal pro uh, way, but, but we think the most practical way because um, there is no five-year plan to take care of King Street and that's, that's a pretty big impact on the system. No, it doesn't hurt. Excuse me. Mm -hmm. It doesn't hurt to mention that and as deferred. Right. You know mm -hmm. the fact that these are more important. But look at the impact of yeah. this particular project. We we carried a line item in the CIP that would, as an alternative to replacing King Street for ten million, of actually inspecting it and maybe doing a lining or a rehab of it. It was lined in the seventies, I think it was, with shot Creek. So it's got like a concrete liner on it now. Mm -hmm. um, we haven't CCTV to, to know what condition that liner is or, or whatever, but um, when when Pam had the risk assessment map up, like that King Street corridor was one of the top high risk pipes, primarily because it's it's not in the middle of the road. It passes in the vicinity of buildings. It actually passes under some buildings. Under um, the hotel. At one point, it used to go under the Hotel Northampton, but no no longer. Um, but but for though for that reason alone, plus it's a 48 inch pipe that carries a lot of the city's flow, that makes it like a really high high consequence of failure pipe, right? Um, and given it's, you know, I talked earlier about how age is not a great indicator of, of condition. Um, we used age, you know, but we, we kind of did it begrudgingly because we didn't have great condition information. So I think, you know, we want to, there is a line item there to inspect that sewer, just make sure that it's in good shape. If it's in good shape, you know, you're probably okay with it for the next, you know, while, but if you need to rehab it, there's a line item in there for rehab as well, and that's, you know, kind of a planning level number, we have to take a look at it to get more detail. Yep. 
Sorry. Go ahead. Was it in the was it in the eighties that we that King Street was done? Eighty eight. Yeah. King Street was reconstructed. Yeah. Yeah, not seventies. So I mean eighty eight. Yeah. But that's the kind of thing no, that's gonna come the, up. This, this, line is, this, is, this is part of the King Street sewer line. This this sewer line runs between King and State Street. Cross country. Cross country. Oh. <coughs> but it's oh, called it's oh, called the okay. King Street. Oh, right. It used to okay, be called King Street yeah. Brook. Okay. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 So I, I think another challenge that we have in presenting this to the public is that um, the staff has done a terrific <coughs> job running the plant and holding it together despite its deteriorated condition. So we don't have <coughs> permit violations that often drive communities to spend money on their facilities. So we, we're going to the public saying it's falling apart but the staff is doing such a great job, we're not in trouble yet. And uh, you know, that's, that's kind of a tough message too. You get the best spokesman right over here. Yeah, I'm not do. kidding. I know. You get the best spokesman right over here. He has great credibility in the community. He's, mm -hmm. he's worked it his whole life. He knows and it inside and in some way, he should be incorporated into the presentation in a way that, that uh, oh, I think shaking his head. Don't listen to him. You mean Broadway? Yeah. <laughs> Seriously. No, I mean, it's, it's that kind of, it's, it's, it's getting that, that kind of, uh, of support that comes from uh, comfort that people have with, with those delivering the message. Which and that's, that would be him. You would have a great spokesman in Jim Zimmerman. I'll tell you right now. So I don't doubt that. We just both will. You got another great one at Jim Dawson. Just, just to follow up on what you're saying, I think it might be a good idea to actually get a list of repairs, an emergency type repairs that have had to be done by the wastewater treatment plant mm -hmm. operators within the last year or two. I mean, you could say you could date it. I mean, you could basically say a timeline. You know, we're doing normal operations. We had to stop and do this emergency, and then we had to jury rig it this way to make it work like this. There might be. Hmm? There might be something. Good thought. There. And I like, essentially, this treatment facility picture with these um, major findings. In. Mm -hmm. You know, we couldn't read it on here, but it's read more readable here, having that blown up for, and more readable for the public. I think right. Excellent. On the poster board. Want to see this? As a separate standalone? Even better. Okay. Yeah. But I think as part of the presentation, you'd be able to see this. Do, uh, do we have a flow diagram um, oh. showing that, basically that image showing which way you stood up and, and when you yeah. presented, you talked about the water goes in here, it comes up here, goes this way, goes over there, it goes over there. I think that would be helpful. It, so to take that diagram and put it on that. People will recognize that. They Although you can do it in a PowerPoint and highlight it well, as yeah. it goes through it, too. Yeah. But I think having posters where the shy people will just stand in the back of the room and see the whole thing yeah. and really yeah. take their time to yeah. look at it. More questions or comments? Well, Dave and Pam, thank you very much. Yeah, it's very helpful. Was, um, a nice presentation and it got us into some very good discussion. Yep. No, absolutely appreciate you letting us come in and present and realize we it was a very broad brush, but we had to at least be able to digest it to some degree and there was a lot more details as you know Ned had passed around the the backup spreadsheets to the individual projects and stuff like that. So you know that's all available and we're available for questions at any time so feel free to reach out to us. Since this is a regular commission meeting, is there anything any of the commissioners want to bring up at this point? Just get there. Um, I saw some uh, work ahead signs or something like that. I wouldn't say uh, road work ahead signs uh, posted on. Um, Woodlawn. Yeah. Is that, is no. that the repaving? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. The paving operations from Massasoit. Yeah. And then. Uh, so that's going to start the first week in August? Yes. yes. Do we know which one goes first? I uh, don't know exactly which yet, but they're they're going to be working in that neighborhood right. first, as far as I know. They have the millers scheduled to start that first week in August, and typically what they've done is to go through and mill all the streets that need to be milled, so things would be sort of blown up for a little while. Is it Woodlawn full depth? Really? Woodlawn, we're doing a band-aid on Woodlawn. Oh, we are? Okay. <laughs> 
It'll be better than it is now. It'll be better, <laughs> really long, be better when we mill it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I haven't driven on Woodlawn Avenue for three years. Oh, you should go down it. <laughs> no, no, it was, was, was a beauty this spring. <laughs> yeah. Um, Pat, you in here? No, yeah. Bro? No. NJ? No. David? Okay, okay. Yeah, perfect. Yeah. Good Move to adjourn. Move. Favor? Aye. We are adjourned. <laughs>